In this lecture, we will cover the basic concepts and standard patterns used in parallel programming. We will look at how to split up a problem so that it can be parallelized, and what are the issues that might be associated with the way we do this. So here's just a brief outline of the lecture. First of all, we will consider why we bother with parallel programming in the first place. And then we will look at some of the standard patterns used to break down, that is, to decompose our problem so that it can be parallelized. Notice that in this slide, in the top right hand corner, there is a green tag. You will occasionally see this tag in some of the slides, and within the tag there will be a name, and that is the name of the practical that is associated with the information in that slide. Okay, so let's start with why we bother with parallel programming when it's so much harder than serial programming. So serial programming is typically what you do on your laptop, say in Fortran or C or Python, and these are the programs that you run on your laptop. They're sequential. Why do we not just stick with that? Well, if we want to run powerful um, computational programs, we want to do large simulations, large calculations, then we need lots of computational processing power. Why can't we just use single processors? Well, we've basically reached the limitation for how fast a single processor can go. They can't get any faster. Why? Because if we try and miniaturize them further, we really are hitting the physical limitations of, for example, the speed of light. And even if we could miniaturize them further, um, in order to generate more power, they would generate a lot more heat, too much heat than is acceptable. And this technology to do this is very expensive. Um, and we're already looking at a few tens of atoms in terms of the size of these uh, single core processors. So basically, Uniprocessor design has reached its limitation. Therefore, rather than trying to make one processor much faster, why don't we look at using lots of processors? Now, multi-core processing uh, power with parallelism is not a silver bullet. Um, so by that, what we mean is that it's not just some black box that we can use where we can just say, okay, great, we're going to use multiple cores and that's going to solve our problem. Typically, um, parallelization, as we will see, is done by hand. It depends a lot on your experience. Um, there are some general patterns and guidelines that you can use to help you, but it's largely done by hand and it's a bit ad hoc. And of course, it also depends on the parallel machine machines that you'll be using to run the problem on. So there's no one solution fits all. There's no silver bullet, unfortunately. Okay, so before we look at parallel patterns um, and how we approach breaking down our problem, let's think about performance. So generally speaking, the main driver, the key thing that we're concerned about when we parallelize our program um, is that we want to solve our problems faster. We want to improve the time to solution. And we do this because, for example, we want to be able to run more difficult problems, more complex problems. We want to be able to run larger problems, larger calculations, or we may even want to run more accurate problems. Um, for example, as we will see later with weather forecasting, you might want to predict the weather more accurately and therefore you need to be able to run uh, larger problems. But also, there are some problems that just cannot be solved. Um, on cannot be Certainly cannot be solved serially and they require just large processing power. So in order to solve new scientific problems, we want to be able to have a faster time to solution. Now we do this to by parallelizing our pro problem. Um, so we want to ex exploit the parallel uh, processing power of parallel computers. And we do this by simply splitting up our program and giving each chunk of our um, problem to a different processor. Now I, oops, sorry about that. Now ideally we would like our program to run p times faster on p processors. So if we have two processors, um, our problem should take half the time that it would on one processor. It should speed up, twice the speed up. But as we will see, not all parts of your program can be successfully split up. That means we cannot parallelize every part of our problem. And furthermore, as we split up our program or our problem, we will see that uh, the way we do it and how we think about pro parallelizing our problem will introduce additional overheads. So it's really a balancing act. Okay, so when we talk about splitting up a problem, what do we what do we mean? Well, when we split up a problem or break it up, 
Um, how we do that is very important. And we break up a problem, we break it up into chunks, and each chunk we say is a parallel task. And the two main things that we want to consider when we're deciding how to break up our problem is basically, um, number one, we want to limit the communication. That is, when we've given a parallel task to a processor or we've given a certain number of parallel tasks to a given processor, we don't want that processor to communicate ideally with any other processor. Or more realistically, we want to limit the amount of time that it spends communicating with other processors because this is time not spent on the calculation. And... Um, Generally speaking, it's relatively more expensive for communication or sending messages between processes than it is for um, running a calculation. The other thing we want to uh, keep in mind, and, and the other thing that is very important, as you will see later on, is balancing the load across all processes. And what that means is we want to make sure that all the processor, processors are equally busy. So balancing the load, i.e. distributing the work um, across all your processes should be done as evenly as possible so that there isn't one processor that's doing lots and lots of work while other processes are just sitting idle. Now here's just some terminology. Uh, if you have a problem where you've split up your problem so that all the processes have to do a lot of communicating with each other um, and that cannot be avoided, so there's a lot of interaction between the different parallel tasks, we, we call this a tightly coupled problem. At the other extreme, if you have a problem which you can break down so that the parallel tasks do not need to communicate with each other whatsoever, i.e. they're completely independent, so a processor is oblivious of all, what all the other processors are doing, this is called an embarrassingly parallel problem. And this is the ideal. Ideally, we want to have basically zero communication between processors. Um, however, in reality, uh, many, many problems do not fall in that uh, group and what we see that in reality actually most problems sit between these two extremes of tightly coupled problems and embarrassingly parallel problems and you will explore this further in the sharp and practical. Okay so let's look at how we break up our problem into parallel tasks. What's what, How do we do this efficiently? How do we approach this problem efficiently? Well once you've decided that you want to parallelize your problem the very first thing, the most important thing really, is to consider how you're going to break up your problem. And how we do this and, and which patterns we choose or, or which uh, sets of patterns we choose and how we do this really depends on a number of factors. So of course it would depend on the type of problem you've got and that's very fundamental. It would also depend on the amount of communication that's required, so how much communication is required between different parts of the program. And of course it's also very important to take into account where you will be running your program on what technology. Is this a program that's going to be run on a distributed memory machine or, or a shared memory machine? As you will learn later on, this will have an impact on uh, the decisions you make about how to decompose your problem. So now we're going to look at just some frequently used patterns um, and consider the advantages and disadvantages of these patterns. A very common way of breaking down your problem is to use geometric decomposition. So say for example we want to calculate the weather forecast over Great Britain. Here on the left is a map of Great Britain and as you can see it's been divided into 2D squares or regions where each region is a parallel task and uh, each parallel task will be given to a processor. Now it may not be obvious from this diagram but each region can uh, is basically largely semi-independent of all other regions so the calculation within this region can be done semi-independently. Here on the right, we have a 3D example of geometric decomposition. This is just um, a part of a knee prosthetic, and as you can see, the different colors here represent different re regions. Okay, so we use geometric decomposition to break down a problem, and it all seems pretty straightforward. Of course, it's not as simple as that. There is a cost, there are associated costs, rather, um, with splitting up your problem in this way. So let's think about it a little bit more. For example, if we go back to our weather example, we have uh, we know that uh, within a region, say for example in the central part of this region, uh, the calculation can be done pretty much independently because weather forecasting is a local activity. So this processor that's running this region would not need to know what all the other processors or the, all the neighboring regions are doing. However, if for example you have something like wind, and it's coming in from one region and going through another and going out to another region, then there needs to be some communication between regions. And 
typically this communication happens at the edge of these region regions. So there is some communication that needs to be done between processes. And this is a cost. Uh, we can try and get around this cost by saying, well, if we make our regions large enough, then there doesn't need to be that much communication because there are only four regions here, for example, communicating with each other. But uh, there is um, a disadvantage to doing this. For example, if you have eight or 16 or 24 processes and you've only got four regions, yes, you've minimized the amount of communication, but you've not been able to exploit the parallelism that's available to you. So if we have large parallel tasks, i.e. Um, if our regions are too big, then typically we suffer from not making the best use of the parallelism available to us. It's little parallelism. If we go to the other extreme and have very, very small parallel tasks and divide up our grid into lots and lots of small regions, here you can see there are lots of parallel tasks, so we can use lots and lots of processes, one, say, for each parallel task. But now all these individual processes have to communicate um, lots. They've got to communicate with all their neighbours and there are lots of processes trying to communicate with lots of neighbours. And even though here we've been able to exploit the parallelism, so we've been able to use more processes, the trade-off has been of course that we've got a larger communication overhead. So how large or small our parallel tasks are um, um, is determined by the granularity of our problem. So if you think of a grain as being a parallel task, um, the size of a grain or the size of chunks of work, um, that will dictate to us the balance, the trade-off between communication and parallelism. So our aim is to minimize communication and maximize computation. Now I mentioned um, communication between different regions. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Well, typically if we have a look here at the central region here, you can see that Surrounding this central region here, there is a border, or if you like, a halo. And this border is replicating um, the edge or a certain chunk of uh, the regions around it, boundaries around it. So this region needs to communicate with the region above it and all the regions surrounding it. And rather than doing this haphazardly, typically what we have in, in parallel programming is that we swap data in bulk at predefined intervals. So um, you can divide up your program into a calculation phase where each region calculates all the, uh, the weather for all the points that it's responsible for. And then it will communicate information at its boundaries to its neighbors and it will get information from the boundaries of its neighbors so that it can carry on with its calculation. So you have a calculation phase, a communication phase, a calculation phase and a communication phase. And for the communication phase, of course, all the processes have to be ready at the same time to communicate with each other. And typically we do this by halo swapping. So this is the halo, this boundary here around this region. This is this region's halo. And at a, a given communication phase, it will swap all the information here with its neighbor and vice versa. And we, and we don't typically let each point communicate um, one at a time. We bulk swap. Um, so this is a little bit more efficient. Um, and of course, if you have lots and lots of small regions, you can see that there will be lots of lots of small messages to send uh, to the neighbors and to receive from the neighbors, and that will increase your communication overhead. So we have discussed so far geometric decomposition and some of the issues associated with it. For example, the granularity of our problem and uh, the trade-off between parallelism and communication overhead. But those are not the only factors to consider. For example, if we go back to our weather forecasting example, you will notice that in some of the regions there was more land than in other regions. For example, in the central region here, there's a lot of land, whereas in this lower left region here, there is basically no land, it's just all water. And we can imagine that calculating the weather over land takes a lot longer than calculating the weather over the water. So the processor that's responsible for this region will have a lot more work to do than the processor that's responsible for this region with no land in it. Now, given that, if we assume that all processors have the same rate of work, we know that the processor that has more land um, will take longer to finish uh, its task. So the execution time of your program is actually determined by your slowest processor, i.e. the processor that has the most amount of work to do. And when you have an uneven distribution of work or an uneven load across processes so that some processes will finish 
their work and be idle waiting for other processes to finish. That's called load imbalance. And you really want to avoid this idle time, this dead time, because especially if you have lots of communication between different processes, if one processor finishes before another, then uh, um, one processor will have to be idle until um, the other processor is ready to communicate. What we ideally want is that each processor should have roughly the same amount of work, i.e. there should be load balance. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. If we look at this uh, diagram here on the left, this is a picture of Mona Lisa, and we can see that the picture has been divided into six, 16 regions. And let's say we have 16 processors, so each processor gets a region. And let's say that we're running um, a program that identifies facial features, for example. Now, if we look at the top left-hand corner, we can see that here, um, the processor that's responsible for this parallel task will finish very quickly because it doesn't have any features to identify. This is just uh, the sky. Uh, if we look at this region here, however, we can see that the processor that has to work out the features here, uh, we've got an eye, we've got another eye, and we've got a nose, this processor will have to do a lot of work and it will take a lot longer than the processor that has no features to identify. So this is not a very well um, balanced way of um, splitting up the problem. Here we have clearly have load imbalance because this processor will be finished before this one um, and if there's any communication that needs to be done it will be poor. Now if we however uh, increase the number of parallel tasks we have. So here we have 8 by 8 parallel tasks, um, so that's 64 parallel tasks, and we still have only 16 processes. That's great. We've got lots and lots of parallel tasks. So what we can do now is we can say that, well, while this, for example, this processor or this region is being calculated on a particular processor, uh, the processor that's responsible for this region might finish its task much, much sooner. Um, but whilst um, a processor with more work, for example, this one, is still doing uh, its calculation, it can just grab another parallel task and start calculating it. So one processor can do this region, then it can go into this region, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and so on, whilst the processor responsible for this region um, remains calculating the feature. And that's a better way of balancing the load. This means that um, processes that finish quickly uh, don't remain idle, they're just given more work to do. Um, and that means we have better load balancing. Of course, if we split up the problem eh, too much, um, as we saw with the weather forecasting example, then of course we're going to run into overhead communication overhead problems. So clearly there is some sweet spot between having um, too few parallel tasks um, that are too large um, and having too, uh, too many parallel tasks that are too small. There is some sweet spot in between. Um, now there is something else called work stealing, which I'm not going to go into, um, but basically the idea here is that if there is... Um, a processor that has too many tasks and it's taking too long to finish its task, another processor can steal some of its tasks so that you can still have good load balance. Um, but the main idea here is that splitting up the problem so that you have more tasks than you have processors will help load balancing up to a point where if you split up your problem too much then you will run into communication overhead. Okay, so you could um, in practice or in general implement this type of problem as a task farm. What is a task farm or a master worker um, parallel pattern? Basically you have one processor which is designated the master and all other processors are workers. And what, It's the master's job to farm out lots of different parallel tasks to each worker and typically it doesn't know right at the start of the program how many tasks or which tasks it's going to give to which worker but it will just um, assign, say, if you have P processors, the master um, processor will assign P tasks initially, and as soon as a worker has finished its task, it will ask the master, it will give the master the result, and then it will ask the master for more work. And this sort of task farm parallel pattern works when you have very distinct independent tasks. So, i.e., when the tasks, the parallel tasks, don't require lots of communication. So, for example, our weather forecasting example wouldn't be ideal for this type of parallel pattern because, of course, there needs to be communication between the different regions. Now, as in the previous example, the Mona Lisa example, we want to have ideally more tasks than there are processes so that when a, a processor has finished its task, it can just grab another task and keep going. And uh, we don't have idle workers. <laughs>
some things to consider with the task find um, parallel pattern, and that is uh, the communication is solely between master and worker. So, like I said, um, problems that are ideal for task farms are ones where the parallel tasks don't require any communication between each other. So, master communicates with worker, and worker communicates with master, but typically workers do not communicate with each other. And now, if you think about this, this could become a problem. Uh, the master process can quickly become a bottleneck if, for example, if your parallel tasks are too small so that a process, a worker processor finishes its parallel task really quickly um, and it's asking for the master process for another task, but actually the master process is busy giving out a task to another worker, then that worker will have to wait. So you can have a problem where workers finish their work too quickly and the master is too slow to respond. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one way to get around this is to have work stealing between workers, but we're not going to go into any detail um, about that. But that is one way around uh, this problem. Now, task farms um, are good for fault tolerance or resilience. What does that mean? Well, if you had, for example, lots of computers that were linked up, lots of independent computers that were communicating with each other over some network, and each computer was a worker, and each uh, computer was communicating with a master computer or master processor. Um, if one of the computers, for example, breaks, has some hardware fault, cannot complete its task, the master might, after a certain amount of time, probe that worker and say, hey, have you finished your task? If it, if it doesn't respond, then the master can take away that task from that worker and give it to another worker. So in this way, you can imagine that whatever problem you're working on, whatever calculation is being done, it doesn't come to a halt. It doesn't get completely stopped when one of the workers um, has a problem. So this is a type of fault tolerance um, that task farms are, uh, are good for. However, typically in parallel programming, we don't, we cannot use task farms for this because uh, typically if uh, a processor or a core is faulty, then the whole program will fall down um, and we generally assume that all the hardware has to work equally well at all times. Okay, so that's task farms. What are some of the other parallel patterns that we can consider? Well, um, pipelines, uh, what I'm going to discuss now, is another way of uh, decomposing your problem. And in a pipeline, we can think of it as an assembly line. For example, if you had a production line for a car and you had lots of different parts, so for example, your stage one for the production line would be create the engine of the car. Stage two might be create the body of the car. Stage three might be attach wheels. Stage four, attach body and engine, etc. And stage five and so on. So the overall calculation can be broken down into stages and you have data coming in at one end um, here on the left, stage one, and the data moves through all the different stages until you get your final result. So in terms of parallel programming, you can imagine that each stage is run on a different processor, and each, each stage only needs to communicate with its, uh, the stage before it and the stage after it. And as you can see, there is clearly one-way flow of data. Um, so... This actual this this parallel programming pattern it was very popular at the beginning of parallel um, programming, but it's not so much popular now, and it's typically um, seen as a paradigm, as a pattern in hardware um, and high level scientific workflows, as I'll discuss a bit later. Um, it's not ideal for parallel programming. Reason being, let's say for example we have six processes and we've broken down our calculation into five stages, as shown in this diagram. Well. That's great if we have five processes, but if we have six processes, what's, what is the sixth processor going to do? If each stage goes to a processor, we clearly have one idle processor. So you can see that pipelines are not great for scaling. Um, it's not as easy to break down a stage, an identified stage of a calculation, into smaller stages. It's not like, we, grid, uh, like the geometric decomposition where we can make our parallel tasks smaller and smaller. That's not so easy for pipelines. Usually there are only a set number of stages that you can identify within a calculation. So pipelines are not really ideal for parallel programming. However, they do crop up a lot in hardware. Um, but let's just have a look at an example of what would happen if we were to use it in a parallel program. So as you see here, um, each color represents a particular processor. And um, 
and each processor is running its own stage, a particular stage. Um, so we've got stage one here on the left through to stage four on the right. And data comes in here at the left. And if we think of time as moving from the top to the bottom row, um, we see that d chunk one of the data goes in and it's on processor one and it gets processed. And once processor one has finished processing chunk uh, one, it passes that on to um, processor two, which starts um, working on ch data chunk one. But whilst it's doing that, uh, a second chunk comes into the pipeline and processor one can work on that. And we just carry on like this, filling up the pipeline. And you can see that initially, as you're filling up the pipeline, all the other processes or many of the processes are idle and they're waiting for data to come. But once there is data um, on all the processes and once the pipeline is full, this is actually quite an efficient way of um, processing your data. Uh, similarly, as the pipeline gets empty, so you can imagine here uh, where data chunk one is finished um, and um, we have a result uh, and all these data chunks move forward, processor one is going to become idle and then processor two and processor three and so on. Okay, so as I said, we don't really use this in parallel programming as much, um, but you do see um, lots of examples of pipelines um, in, for example, CPU architecture. So um, at the uh, inst instruction level, if we are thinking of calculating, uh, say, multiplying two floating point numbers together, then that in itself will require lots of low-level instructions, um, and it will require, say, for example, something like a 20-stage pipeline of fetch, decode, execute, write-back instructions, very low-level um, stuff. Uh, another type of pipeline, for example, is the Unix shell. If you're familiar with um, different commands, for example, here we've got um, cat data file. So you've got some data file, you open it, you have a look at what's inside and you chain um, a bunch of commands together. So here we've got cat and then you pipe that through to grep. Grep looks for um, any line with the word energy in it in the data file. And then all that information is piped through to awk which then prints the values associated with those lines. So that's a type of a pipelining when you chain commands together. And of course, you also have GPU pipelines where um, for graphics processing, for example, you are rendering, coloring, shading, all these different stages to produce your final graphics work. And that's a type of pipeline. But these are all very low level um, CPU, GPU architecture type pipelines. Um, if we're thinking a bit more high level, what we see now, very typical in scientific um, calculations is that you have different stages to get um, from the raw data to the final results. For example, in a scientific, typical scientific workflow, you would have reading the data, that would be your first stage, then you'd have processing the data, that would be your second stage, and then you, you do some calculation, that's your third stage, and then you might uh, post-process your results, that's your fourth stage, and your final stage might be visualizing the results. And each of these stages um, could be made up of uh, a single program or many programs, and each of these stages might be run on different machines. For example, you might have a, a, a specialized graphics machine for visualizing the results. Um, and this type of scientific workflow, this type of pipeline, if you like, is uh, becoming more and more relevant for large distributed scientific workflows. And of course, within each stage, you could imagine that although you have this high-level pipeline, each stage could um, use different parallel programming patterns within it. Okay, so that's pipelines. And before we finish, I just wanted to talk a little bit about loop parallelism. So serial programs, especially scientific uh, computational programs, are very much dominated by intensive loops. And loop parallelism is a way to incrementally, in small steps, introduce parallelism to your program. And what you do typically is you look at your code and you identify the major loops, the big loops, that are taking up a lot of your time, a lot of the program's time, and you try and parallelize them. This is a very nice way of um, introducing parallelism to your problem because you can do it in small steps and you don't have to restructure your entire code, you don't have to scrap your code completely and come up with a new way of breaking down your problem. You can just slowly, slowly, step by step, introduce some parallelism. This is called small scale parallelism and it tends to work best for problems with lots of intensive loops and loops where each iteration of the loop is independent of all other iterations in the loop. 
And of course, that's not suited for all architectures. As, as you'll see in later lectures, for large distributed memory architectures, um, small-scale parallelism is not going to exploit the full parallelism that's available with these types of machines. Also, not all loops are parallelizable. If you have a loop where um, the x x iteration is dependent on the x minus 1 iteration, then uh, it, that's not going to be very amenable to parallelism. And of course, finally, if your overall runtime is not dominated by your loops, so if there's some other factor that is slowing down your program, then of course parallelizing loops will not actually give you much benefit. And we'll come across that later in the next lecture when we look at performance metrics and scalability. So before we finish, just a quick example of loop parallelism. Um, if we uh, look here, all we're doing is initializing an array of integers. And the part that is parallelized here is the part that has this parallelizing uh, uh, pragma or this directive here, this parallelization directive, which comes from OpenMP, which you will come across in later lectures. And all this does is the programmer says, okay, I want to parallelize this loop, I'd like this loop parallelized, and, it, and uh, you write the directive here just above the loop, and it's up to the compiler basically to decide how to parallelize that. It, you don't need to worry about the details, and that's another attractive feature of loop parallelism. You don't need to go into the nitty gritty, you just tell the compiler, please do your best to parallelize this loop and leave it up to the compiler. And of course, um, as you'll see later on with OpenMP, there are lots of fine tuning parameters that you can introduce to get the best performance out of this type of parallelism. Okay, so to summarize, um, there are lots of different things to consider when you're thinking about parallelizing your problem. There are various patterns that exist that you can use to help guide you um, uh, to find ways to figure out what is the best way to parallelize your problem. You'll see some of these examples in the practicals that you will do, um, but it's not really straightforward. As I said right at the start, um, there is no silver bullet, it's not a black box, there are no magic tricks, um, it's a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of experience, and um, checking that you're taking all the issues, for example, communication overhead, um, um, load imbalance into account.